The film that you are about to see is of Elvis Presley, relatives and friends, during the summer of 1956. Elvis, tell us uh, why you think you are the big success that you are. Uh, no, I don't. I can't think of anything. This is the boy that probably the hottest show business personality in the last 25 years. Gorgeous, to say the least. He was just the best looking thing I had ever seen in my life. 1955. He was he was already pretty big in the southern states, and he was appearing at the um, Airmen's Club at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi. Then he took a break from singing. So I just glanced his way, because we had made eye contact a few times. He just made, made his way through these people. As we were passing by, he reached through the crowd and grabbed me by the arm. He said, well, uh, when I get through playing, um, how about you stick around for a little while and show me the town? And I didn't even kiss anyone on the first date. And I don't know why I couldn't resist kissing Elvis Presley on the first date, but I just could not resist. He wanted to take me with him that very night. And he wanted to go in and wake my mother up and say, June is going to come with me. This one friend, about 10 months after I had first met Elvis, she decides to take a vacation in 56. I didn't really know that the reason she wanted to go to Memphis was because Elvis lived in Memphis. I didn't really tell anyone I had ever gone out with Elvis. So we drove over to Audubon Drive, and the pink Cadillac drives in the driveway, and it was Elvis and his mother and father. He said, what are you doing here, June? He had tried to call me, and I was never home. But my heart was in my throat then, you know, because he had already done lots of big things and whatever. And then the following morning, he picked me up, and we went motorcycle riding. And he said he had a vacation coming up, and he would be down in Biloxi. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> that was it. And so sure enough, Elvis arrived in Biloxi. We had stayed in touch by phone. I wasn't home, but when he drove up, in front of my house. I lived pretty close to Sacred Heart Girls High School. And all these girls were piled up in my front yard, big welcoming committee, but, but I was nowhere in sight. I didn't really know when he was coming in. And he got really mad with me because he thought I told everyone he was coming. And I said, Elvis, you drive into town on a Tennessee license tag and you think I told everyone you was coming, you know? So uh, he was registered at the Sun and Sand Hotel under the name of Arthur Hooten, one of his buddy's names. It wasn't one he, he made up. He used to use it when he checked in to different places. And to call and ask for Arthur Hooten. So I did that, and Elvis answered the phone. And so then we drove down to Sun and Sand. Well, how long have you been on vacation? So, uh, about a month. I'm off for about three more weeks. Well, Elvis, we wish you lots and lots of good luck in your continued meteoric rise to stardom, which has been so phenomenal during the past couple of months. My mother's um, boyfriend that she was dating at the time wanted to do something so that he could spend some time with Elvis, mainly because he was impressed with Elvis as a gentleman. He liked Elvis because he respected his mother and father. Everything he said was, yes, sir, and no, ma'am, and thank you, and please. Eddie had not really kept up with uh, Elvis's career or anything like that. He liked him as a young man. So he invited him to go on a fishing trip. He said, I'll take care of everything. We left by ourselves Pier Thursday morning and had a very successful fishing trip off the Biloxi coast. And he said that, would, that was the first trip he'd ever been on as far as deep sea fishing or any kind of fishing. He made all the arrangements, brought all the food, not one beer on the boat because he asked Elvis, what would, what would you like to drink? And he said, um, Coca-Cola, root beer. He fell in love with Bark's root beer. Elvis didn't want any alcohol, and we didn't have a, not even a beer on the boat. And uh, I was pretty thirsty, and so was my friend, the captain, that owned the boat. 
and I was talking with him on the side, and I happened to say, boy, wouldn't the cold beer go real good right now? And he said, it definitely would. Elvis overheard, that, overheard me, and he came up to me, he said, Mr. Bellman, he said, you could have brought beer for you and, and your friend, but I didn't want any for my friends, um, myself. When you go out on the boat, you usually come across a shrimp boat that you swap a six pack of beer for a bucket of chum. So we had no beer to swap for, for chum when we came across the boat. So I think he gave the man a $10 bill for a bucket of chum. If you're not familiar with what chum is, chum is trash fish. They, they throw away the, the old fish that they'd bring in and save just the shrimp. This is Elvis there checking the uh, catch of the, of the small fish that we were going to use for bait. We used the trash fish to draw the other fish in. As a friend of Elvis, most of the things that he did was sleep. There's Elvis and June. And there's June's mother and June and Elvis. Oh, I thought he was a, uh, a well-bred boy. And uh, I liked him right off the, right off the start. I, I liked Elvis because he, was, uh, he wasn't uh, loud. He didn't use any foul language. And uh, he was just a, a fine, well-cut man. I really thought the world of him. We caught a nice variety of fish. We caught bonita, dolphin, shark, and king mackerel. Lots of sharks. Uh, Jack Crevel, they weigh in like 60 pounds. We caught some ling or lemon fish. It was something new to him because he never had, had uh, you know, been deep sea fishing before. That stick is a boom on top of the boat. And it looked like a giant uh, microphone. He was just standing up there and he saw this big thing, started pretending he was singing to this tall mic. It was funny. That was, was funny. We got away from the fishing crowd and went to spend some alone time on top of the boat. So, but Elvis was getting so sunburned, he, uh, I mean, he should have never got on the top of the boat, you know, no shade. On the way back to Biloxi, Elvis asked if I could arrange to get the boat again. So I asked my friend, the captain, he said, yes, we can arrange it. He said, I want to take my parents. Well, that's all, all Mr. Bellman had to hear. He said, my daddy will love this. And he says, my mom will probably like it too, but I know my daddy's gonna love this. But he immediately went to the phone. And he called them long distance from the sun and sand. We were all in the room with him. He said, I want y'all to come down Saturday morning and go fishing. So he said, Mr. Bellman, charter that boat again. And his mother and father came down the next day and I met him and the following day we went fishing again. And his mother and father fished, Elvis fished, all his friends fished, June fished, everybody fished. I didn't fish, I was busy taking footage with my little eight millimeter camera. <laughs> it was in my closet for years and years and years, and it held up very well. I even loaned it to one of Elvis's friends to take out of town with him, and you know, I, he could have lost it. Uh, something could have happened, but he brought it back to me, and thank God, because it was the only film I had, you see, but I'm fortunate that he took care of it and brought it back to me. Yeah, all this time it was stored away in my closet. That's amazing, isn't it? The second time, well, it was a, the same crew, but the second time, Elvis's mother, Elvis's father, um, Gene Smith, Elvis's cousin, always with the, uh, the Memphis gang. Red West, Arthur Hooten, uh, Mr. Bellman, uh, my friend Pat Napier. I mean, we just knocked the fish dead. At least a hundred fish. Elvis's father, Elvis's mother, they loved it. They really loved it.
Mrs. Presley brought a jar of peanut butter and bananas. She brought bananas too. Somehow during the day, she managed to make him a peanut butter and banana sandwich. His mother was looking after Elvis like he was a young child, and she was kept bringing him peanut butter sandwiches. Which we all came to call uh, an Elvis Presley sandwich. So, and uh, you'll see in the video, the way he's, he's holding his pole, your hands get fishy messing with all of that stuff, so you really don't want to touch your food. And Elvis is like eating his sandwich backwards. It's real awkward when you'll notice how crazy he's eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But Mrs. Presley had made that for him special. Before he started eating, she was holding it for him to, to take bites. Evidently, he was she wasn't feeding it, feeding him fast enough or something. So she, he took it and was eating it, fishy hands and everything. So. Elvis loved his mother dearly, very, very much. I had never ever seen a son-mother relationship so close. There was something extra special there. She not only was his mom, she was his best friend. She was someone he could confide in. She was someone he could go to problems with and she'd give him the right answer. She was someone that he tremendously looked up to. Where I remember when I first went on the road with Elvis, she would tell me, she would say, George, now, now you make sure that he calls home and talks to me and, and remind him to call me every night. And he would, he would call his mom every night. She thought Elvis was born to do great things. This was uh, God's gift to her. He took the other, the, the twin, he took Jesse away. And so Elvis had the power of two people that he was living for, his, his twin brother and himself, and that he was destined to do great things. There's Elvis and them uh, jazzing it up there. I believe he's singing Don't Be Cruel. He liked fun and he liked good times and he liked people. Eddie Bellman had been in the war and brought those hats back as souvenirs. And Eddie, knowing that we should have had hats on to be out in the hot sun that length of time, brought those hats. And I gave them to Elvis and all his friends. Octoon, that's all they ever said <laughs> in a Memphis twang. Octoon, you know, you do the Heil Hitler, Octoon, that's this stuff. <laughs> I'd, I'd let her go anywhere with him. I trusted her and I trusted him. I was just about as thrilled as she was. So I was always glad to see him come, in, come up, you know. Very much a gentleman, always. Just, uh, you could trust him. And he said, I'd never do anything to hurt you, June, never. When we got back in, two reporters jump on the boat. They ask a few questions. Elvis wouldn't get off the boat and wouldn't talk to them. And so they took a picture that's a, a family picture with me standing there with Elvis's mom and dad and the boat captain. And Elvis and I stayed on the boat. His mom and dad got off. And Mr. Bellman told the captain to take the boat down to the factory. And that way we could lose, get away from the crowd. And don't worry, he would bring the cars down there to us. Oh, when we came in, the, the people on the pier where his car was parked, he asked the captain, he said, do we have to go in here? I, I'm so tired, I hate to face all these people. So we went down the channel, down to the factory. And it was about um, a four mile ride from where, where we were down to the shrimp factories. And that way we could lose, get away from the crowd. But all the way down, there was lines of cars keeping up with us on Highway 90. Just a whole stream of cars. They knew that that was Elvis's boat out there. And they were going real slow, keeping up with the boat. We made it down to the factory. They didn't know where we were going. The cars didn't. It was a line of cars, like a parade, going down the beach. We could see them from the, on the boat and they didn't know where Elvis disappeared to, because he, he really could do some disappearing acts. And how Elvis slipped off that boat, I don't know, because I didn't even see him. Yeah, he had the cars there and everything, so he escaped. When I first met him, he had to leave the motel down here in Biloxi because of the fact that people found out he was, he was there and they kept coming by and banging on his door and everything. The press and the general public and everyone had figured out that he was there. So this is when Mr. Eddie Bellman, the man that took the film, he 
tells um, Elvis that he has a rental house completely furnished that's off the beaten path. So I took him to the house. They brought his Cadillac later, but they pulled it way in the back where nobody would see it. Some of the neighbors spotted it. And the first thing you know, the crowd was all around the house, aggravating him. Come on out, Elvis, and give, says, give us your signature. Come on out and sing for us. And so he was trying to get a little rest and take a nap, and he just couldn't. So he said, Eddie, he said, I guess I'm going to have to go somewhere else. So finally, uh, Mr. Bellman makes arrangements for him to go to Gulf Hills. He rented a villa there along the bayou front. But then a house, he wanted a house that was more private than a public villa where every, other people were staying. So he rented a, a, a family-owned house. I got him a house out there at Gulf Hills. And that, that's how he wound up at Gulf Hills. He leased the house for the summer, the hack, H-A-C-K, the hack house. The reason Elvis had so much privacy in Gulf Hills was because the, the roads are, are curved and winding and you come to a fork in the road or a cross road and you can make the wrong little fork and you're completely in a different area and that's why people didn't go looking for Elvis at Gulf Hills because it was so easy to get lost and that's where we would come and go from. Well, the rest of June and July. So I asked Elvis, would he mind making a five minute appearance at my shoe department. I had a lady's shoe department and a, and a lady's wear store. I mean, he said, well, how about tomorrow? So I, I told the man that owned the store that I was leasing the department for him. I said, Elvis could come by tomorrow and make an appearance here. Would you like for him to come by? Definitely, definitely, he said. He said, are you sure he's coming? He says, I want to call up all the TV stations around the area and all the radio stations and let them know about that. People started calling from Mobile and Jackson, Mississippi, New Orleans, Memphis, and said, is Elvis really coming down there? People started pouring in down here from all directions. When they saw that pink Cadillac, they, know Elvis, they knew Elvis was here. So that's the reason why I had to take him in my car, because they were crowded all around the building, all over the street, and, and, and we, I made him lie down, sort of, and, and we kind of slipped in the back door pretty good without people knowing it. Uh, they had the whole police department out there directing traffic, and they had to let them in and shift. They liked to tore the man's store up, but he didn't mind that. He got so much good publicity, he didn't mind that at all. The man that owned the store that I leased the department from, he said, let's give Elvis a present. I said, that's not necessary. I said, he's doing this because I took him on a couple of fishing trips. And I said, he's not expecting it. He said, let's give him something anyway. He said, you go ahead and make arrangements. I said, well, if you want to give him something, I said, let's, let's give him a shotgun. I got a 410 gauge Winchester pump. Fine little gun. We presented that to Elvis, and boy, he was just as happy as a child eating ice cream. Elvis uh, really liked guns. A lot of people collect guns, and it was no different from other people. He had a fascination for, for weapons, and he would collect them and have fun with them. We'd go out target shooting, you know, and stuff like that. I brought some skeet targets out to uh, Gulf Hills, and I brought my little 28-gauge Remington automatic, which was my favorite gun. It had a little bit more spread to it than the 410 gauge that I gave Elvis, so I let him shoot my 28 gauge so he'd have a better chance at hitting the targets, you see? And he did pretty good. He missed a few, but he hit, he hit a little more than he missed. And he let his friends shoot and all that. We just had a ball. Later on, we'd get back to the house and lounging around, and then somebody brought a BB gun up there. And everybody started shooting the BB gun, and even Elvis. He held a cigarette paper in his hand like that to let somebody shoot the, with the BB gun to shoot the paper out of his hand. He did, that's a fact. And luckily, the guy didn't hit his thumb. <laughs> Elvis said he had gotten in a, a big box of uh, souvenirs that Colonel Parker used to peddle at his personal appearance tours. And he reached in and, and took out this pink 
scarf. I'm surprised it's not falling apart. It's been quite a few years. He took one out of the box and draped it around my neck and pretended to be strangling me with it. I don't know why I kept it all these years, but I'm glad I did. You know, it don't take long to get sunburned out here if you're not accustomed to it. And if you're fast skinned like he was, he was sort of fast skinned. He got very sunburned. He peeled about three layers of skin. It did take effect on him. Later on in the film, you'll see Elvis on water skis. And the reason he's wearing long sleeve shirt and long pants is because he was so sunburned, he couldn't let anything, any, any more sun touch his skin. He was just, he peeled gobs. He was skiing out at Gulf Hills and he had a, a shirt on and a life, life jacket because of that because he had gotten sunburned. The most asked question that I've ever been asked was Elvis a good kisser? And it was mostly from young teenage girls and by letter. And I used to answer a lot of this fan mail. And you had to be careful when you're Writing back to a 12 or 13 year old, how do you describe a passionate kiss to a 13 year old without having their mothers go through the roof, you know? So I'd give it a lot of thought and I said, his kisses were perfect. They weren't too dry, they weren't too wet, they weren't too sloppy or anything like that, you know, with lips slightly parted. And that was not true, they weren't slightly parted. I was probably sucked half my face off. But I was careful when I would write to these kids. But he was a marvelous kisser. Elvis had real soft, full lips. He, he said I was a good kisser. He wanted to know, where did I learn how to kiss? And I said, I didn't know that kissing needed lessons, you know. And I said, I think I'm learning right here from you. And the second most asked question was, did you go to bed with him? <laughs> I didn't answer that one. It's funny because back in 1955, Things were different than they are today. You know, there, there were only a few bad girls in the whole school, you know, if you know what I'm talking about. Elvis and I had gone for a, a ride just to get out of the house. It was late in, in the night when he used to, he was a night traveler. And we just took a ride. His mom had made some um, cookies and we took a bag of cookies with us and had forgotten about the cookies until we were on our way back home and he came upon a milk truck that was making home deliveries and uh, he said milk would really go good with these cookies so he pulled up behind the, the milk truck and got out and um, asked the milkman for a quart of milk and he reached in his pockets and Elvis never had any money on him and he said I don't have any money on me can I write you an IOU and I think that I read somewhere that this milk delivery man still has this piece of paper with IOU one quart of milk, Elvis Presley. <laughs> but we, uh, we drank the milk right out of the bottle and had milk mustaches. Yeah, he had his cookies and, wait, he had his milk and his cookies too. <laughs> and ate them. You know, you can't have your cake and eat it. Well, he did. <laughs> so let's see what happened next. It also, also took film of June when Elvis was lay, lying on the floor. She was picking blackheads off him. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but you know, we all have them at one time or the other. <laughs> a friend of mine named Buddy Conrad, he was a big Elvis fan from back as far as 1955. I told Buddy I'd let him know when Elvis was going to be in town. And so, uh, but Buddy brought his motorcycle, had one just like Elvis, over to where, where we were, and uh, Elvis just had a conniption fit because he had a motorcycle at his disposal here on his vacation. Elvis loved to ride motorcycles, and there again, that stemmed from the fact that he couldn't really afford a big Harley when he was young. He th uh, the Harley Davidson with the big bikes when we were all teenagers and all, we would all marvel at, whoa, gee, look at that bike, oh, oh what a Harley, that was the big deal. Well, when, when he became famous and, and, and wealthy enough to, to, to afford those bikes, he went out and bought them and loved to ride them. He really liked it. Uh, the movie studios didn't like it too much. 
when Elvis first moved up to Memphis from Tupelo, we were in the exact same class. I remember the first time we actually met in the in eighth grade music class, he brought his guitar to class at Christmas time, got up and sang a couple of songs, and I was amazed. So for a guy to bring a, a guitar to school, a 12-year-old guy, and sing, that was a big deal. I was president of the senior class, editor of the yearbook and all, but when we got out of high school, I became a disc jockey and a TV performer in Memphis and um, tried to help, us help Elvis along with his career. In high school, Elvis was kind of a shy guy, sort of a laid back, quiet guy, unassuming, but he stood out in his own way. He would let his, his hair was longer than anybody's hair in the school, and he had a, some, a little bit of a, signal, a sideburn on there, so that made him different, but he would, the thing that really made Elvis stand out in high school was the way he dressed. Everybody was wearing uh, maybe a t-shirt and uh, a pair of blue jeans or what have you. And Elvis would come to school with a pair of dress pants on with maybe a black pair of pants with a pink stripe down the side and uh, a sport coat with a maybe trimmed in white with a collar turned up. You couldn't miss him. As he would take people through Graceland, he would take you through his trophy room and he'd say, now that's my high school picture there. He said, but if you look at the very top, there's George. He was president of the class. He was one of the few guys that was nice to me in high school. They weren't, they, they weren't really rude to him, but they kidded him. Some of the guys, some of the guys on, on the sports teams or, or of that nature would give him a hard time about the way he wore his hair and the way he dressed. And you know the famous story, they were going to cut his hair in the, in the men's room and uh, some of the uh, guys from the football team had some scissors and Red West was there and Red intruded and said, if you're going to mess with him, you're going to go through me. And Red was a pretty tough guy, so they backed off. And Elvis never actually, at truth be known, never forgot all of that. When I first met him, he was, as you could say, really and truly a young boy. When, when I was in my little office and Elvis and his cousin Jean would come visiting, and they would be there half of the time and Elvis would be combing his hair. The, the most poignant uh, memory I have is that they were sitting underneath the house, they told me, Jean and, and Elvis. And they were so poor, they didn't have any toys, but somehow they managed to have a tiny little toy car. And they would play with that toy car in the sand. And so then when he became so involved with cars and Cadillacs and everything, I think it must have been that he remembered what it was like when he was so young, you know, and so poor. He was a car fanatic. Uh, he once said he couldn't drive by a showroom or, with, or a car lot without stopping and looking. And, and that all stemmed from the fact that when we were very young, we couldn't afford nice cars. And he, many times he would tell me that you're sitting on a curb and or he would sit, stand on the corner and watch all the beautiful cars go by and say, one of these days I'm going to own that big car, I'm going to have that beautiful automobile. Uh, I can afford things that I never would have gotten otherwise if I hadn't gotten lucky in life, you know. I said if I ever had any money, I was going to get my fill of cars. The pink Cadillac actually was black, I think, when they first bought it. And Elvis, uh, at, 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 in, the, in the 50s, in the late to mid to late 50s, pink and black were big colors. Guys would wear pink shirts with a black tie. It was fashionable. So Elvis uh, thought it would be really wild to have a pink uh, Cadillac. So he had it painted pink, and because of who he was, he could get away with that. Elvis spent quite a bit of time at June's mother's house there, you know. When he wasn't over at Gulf Hills, he'd be there, usually. Well, whenever he came there, everybody in Biloxi knew it, it seemed like. And people called and called on the phone. Well, I remember him coming here one day, and um, a lady called on the phone. And she had a little girl that had leukemia. And the little girl was crazy about Elvis, as small as she was. And she called me up and she said, uh, Miss May, is uh, Elvis there? And I said, he sure is. She said, well, I wonder if I came up there, would he spend a little time with Carol? And I, I asked him and he said, sure, come, tell her to come on up. So they came up and they came on in the house and met Elvis. The child brought up the subject of Hound Dog and that was her favorite song and she loved the part where the hound dog wasn't paying attention and that Elvis took the dog by the face and turned it, you know, and the little girl was real shy and, uh, and, and she wouldn't look at Elvis when she was talking to him. And he would take her and turn her face up to his to, um, to hear what she was saying. And it wasn't but about maybe a month or so that she had passed away. But she had got her wish to, you know, to be with Elvis. He was a fine person. I don't know of anybody that was any nicer than Elvis because he, he was just a, a, a great guy. 
he treated me like I was something special, you know. He was very, very nice to work with. He had a serious side to his nature. I think he took his art seriously, but he didn't take himself seriously. I remember when uh, one, one day I, he was getting ready for, for a recording session. And uh, I said to him, lots of luck, Elvis. And Elvis says, I'll need it, I'll need it. So I said, oh, well, you, you, listen, you're the biggest thing in the world. He says, tomorrow I may not be worth a, a nickel. I asked him one night what kind of a feeling did he get when he walked out on that stage. He, he couldn't understand it, for one thing. Well, you've seen film footage of some of his concerts. It was just unbelievable, just unbelievable. And the amount of uh, the size of the crowds, I mean, they were just were tearing at one another to get to touch him. It was wonderful just to get to touch him. Uh, he later on described it to me as better than an orgasm, the chills. It was out front, in front of the stage, where all the chaos was. Elvis would create it by his movements on stage and his interplay with the audience and all. And the famous one was in Vancouver, Canada, where uh, Elvis was performing outside on a football stadium, 100,000 people there, and there was nobody on the field. And Elvis comes out on stage and says, well, come on down. And they all emptied on the field, 100,000 people, charged the stage, had to stop the show. Finally, Colonel Parker said, Elvis, we got to get out of here. This is getting dangerous. So Elvis jumped in a police car and took off. And Scotty and DJ and Bill, we jumped in his limousine. Well, the fans charged the stage, turned the stage over, de completely demolished it. Took all the wood parts of the stage for souvenirs, took all the sheet music, took the music stands, took what instruments were left as souvenirs. And then they came to the car where we were. They thought Elvis was in the limousine, but he wasn't. He'd already got away. And uh, they were looking in there, and they, they said, well, Elvis, and we said, he's not in here. He's not. We're hollering through the window because we had the windows rolled up. And so, so they took knives, and they went down the side of the car to scrape off paint for souvenirs. They pulled the license plates off. They broke the aerial off. They were about to demolish the car. Then they started rocking the car. So I put the window down, and I told one of the police officers, I said, hey, you know, they're going to kill us in here. They're going to tear this car up. Can't y'all do anything? The guy, never the guy said, hey, man, Preston's got a lot of money. He can buy another one. So at that moment, uh, Scotty Moore was driving. He said, Scotty, hit that gas pedal. Let's get out of here, man. So Scotty hit that gas pedal, and they kind of got out of the way because we were gonna, coming through, you know, heck or high water. It, it started to get like that. When you, when you visualize a sharecropper's life and, and, and a son who has this wonderful voice, and this, when one speaks about celebrity, status. I don't know because you, you bring a lot of sacrifices for it. He couldn't walk the streets like other people can. He, he had to be careful of what he did. But I think he enjoyed it. After his first, his first day in Miami, after his last show, and we were sitting in the hotel room, and the colonel came in with the script, the Reno brother. So we sat and we were reading the script together. because There was no singing and he was tickled. He was real tickled about that. It was a straight acting part. He was critical, you know, and he said, I sound like a hillbilly. And, when, and this was the first time that Elvis got to see himself on the big screen. He had seen, um, what, do, what do they call it, dailies, but not on a big screen. So he was amazed at the size of, of himself when he was up there, you know, and, and we were all looking, we were all quiet. And uh, his mother was just tickled you know, because he, he looked so good up there. And then they had the audacity to put in one of those damn silly songs during this private screening, and, you know, he just went berserk, you know, and he said, it's, it's a piece of shit, man, it's a piece of shit, it's garbage. He was really upset about that. And I loved it, I thought he was just gorgeous, so big and humongous on the screen, you know, just, <laughs> that's a lot of Elvis up there. <laughs> I think the main reason that he was so upset about singing was because he hated musicals. When we went to see The King and I in Biloxi, and uh, Yul Brynner would turn to Deborah Kerr, and instead of saying, I love you, he start, would start singing, and, and Elvis would say, I can't stand it, I can't stand it, you know, let's get the hell out of here. And so we walked out on The King and I. I thought early on, uh, considering everything, that Elvis was a pretty good actor with what he was doing. They found a niche in Hollywood, and he fit 
perfectly into that niche. Singer, gets in fights, wins the girlfriend, wins the young lady and all of that. You see, that was patterned, I think, a lot after the Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis pictures and the Frank Sinatra pictures because they weren't actors. They were, Frank was a singer and Dean was a singer and Jerry was a comedian. So they had uh, Hal Wallace at, at Paramount. He fit them into situation movies just like Sinatra was. And, and, and for that, I thought Elvis did a pretty good job. But I, I, I do believe that Elvis probably could have been a better actor if he'd had better scripts and better supporting cast and better directors. Colonel Parker had a big to do with deciding what Elvis should do and shouldn't do. Colonel Tom Parker probably was the greatest manager, in my opinion, that ever lived. The other side of Colonel Parker, was, he, he wasn't really uh, artistic-minded. So when we tried to discuss with the Colonel about maybe getting Elvis better movie scripts and better supporting actors, the Colonel rebelled at that. He said, no, he said, all Hollywood is interested in is making money because they were so, so successful. He stuck with the formula pictures. And the irony was he sang through everything. Colonel Parker cared less about Elvis's talent that went to waste because the money was more important to him than Elvis's dreams. Now when I look back on it, it's like a different lifetime because it's, it has been so long ago. It's probably a combination of me, Elvis, and Colonel Parker <laughs> that ended our relationship. Well, in the early years, uh, uh, Colonel Parker did tell Elvis that if he got involved, he felt, you know, some of the fans would say, oh, he's involved, they'd back off a little, go after somebody else. I don't think it was so much June. I just think it was the fact that any, any girl Colonel didn't want Elvis to get involved with her. I think they might have gotten married if it hadn't been for uh, Colonel Parker. That's the reason I think they would have gotten married. But Elvis didn't have to go along with the Colonel on these things. But when you read about Elvis having a house guest over Christmas vacation, I hadn't spoke to him in, other than a telegram in probably four months. You don't, if you, if you love somebody, you don't put them on hold that long, do you? Elvis didn't need me. He had worlds, you know, the whole world full of girls of his choice. If, if I could change the way that things turned out, I would go back and do things different. I wouldn't have been so quick to leave without finding out. I was a little stubborn, a little hard-headed, and I was not going to allow anyone to break my heart. You know, I was, I was not in any hurry to get married. So even though I did get married the following year, out of spite, I think. Elvis wasn't ready to get involved and get tied down at that time. He was out there, and he was great looking. He was rocking and rolling. He was a living legend. Elvis already had um, three gold records at this time. And now he's even a bigger legend. I think back in uh, everybody, there's not a person in this world doesn't know the name Elvis Presley. And Elvis Presley loved me. But, it, but Elvis was not a typical loved one, was he? I got along so well with him, you know, and he thought a lot of me. I'm sure he did, because he did a lot of things for me, you know, anything that I approached him on. He said, I'll be glad to do that for you, because we, we, you've really been nice to, to us and taking us fishing, my mother and father and all of us. I thought that was a tremendous thing on your part, to, to be so nice. As I reflect back on the early days of Elvis, and I'm talking now in the 50s, it was happening so fast and so furious and so quick. It was Ed Sullivan, it was New York, it was Hollywood, it was Million Records. The world was his at that time, you know.
crop-in or reproduction of this film is strictly prohibited. That's it.